this has been quite a season for us. This past week has just been wonderful. We had brothers and sisters from all over the world here. I think he said more than 20 countries and more, more states represented even than that. So I know many of them have headed home. Some are driving to the airport right now. But for those of you who've made it back home, greetings. It was wonderful having you here. And uh, we look forward to when the Lord can bring us back together in His time. So if you have questions today, we're going to worship the Lord and sing. But before we get into that, you know the number is 661-212-5415. You can also post a comment in the, uh, below the YouTube video on the live stream. Again, that number is 661-212-5415. And if you send in your question while we're still on air, then we'll do our best to answer before we get off air. Um, I have a special guest who's going to join us today and tell us his story, but we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, I think we're going to worship the Lord for now. Amen. All right, Andrew. I woke up this morning. Uh, first thing came out of my, my, my mouth was this. I know they've, they've done this song in Virginia. I've never done it before, but I told Brother Andrew, I said, let's, let's try it this morning, this, is, or this afternoon. This is what I felt. Amen. Amen. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountains high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. Oh, all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountains high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me, He's not against me. I will hold to the plans He has for me. When I'm broken, I know He'll fix me. And I will call on the name of the Lord. Oh, all my life, all I know, God's been Mountains high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. Oh, he's my heart song in my sorrow. He's my hope and my strength for tomorrow. When those storms rise all around me, yes, I will call. On the name of the Lord All my life, all I know God's been good, good to my soul Mountains high, valley low I'm gonna see wherever I go I've got joy, joy, joy to my soul. Mountains high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God never turns away a prayer. Prayer is what sustains us. The fervent prayer of the righteous, he will answer and save him out of trouble. 
So never give up, you just wait and see what God is going to do. For when the Lord extends His mighty hand, it's the time to overcome. So just praise Him. You just need to praise Him. When you need Him, praise Him. When you suffer, praise Him. And when you're crying, praise Him. Him. It's all that matters, praise Him, for your praise invades the heavens. Oh, when God goes before you to open the way, He's moving the mountains, He's breaking the chains, a pillar of fire, parting the waters, He opens the doors that no man can close. He works for His people who trust in His Spirit. He's walking beside us by night and by day. Oh, lift up your hands, your Redeemer has come. And sing to the Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the praise. We give you the praise. What God is speaking Even when it seems that He is silent Well, He's working in our hearts Oh, so never give up Just wait and see What God is going to do
You got something? Oh. Amen. Can, can you sing that? When I'm at my end. Sure. It's the same sort of praise song. Good. But okay. Sister Regina got us started. I'm at my end, you're just getting started. When I hit a wall, you just walk through. When I face a mountain, you are the maker. So it's God to move. When I'm out of faith, you are still faithful. When I'm at my worst, you are still good. And all of my questions, you are the answer. It all points to you. Cause you're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working away. There's no way out This one thing I know You're still on your throne So whatever I'm feeling I still got a reason to praise 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 Out of our walls You and out of the cross flows rivers of grace. And out of the grave, the burst of revival, no tomb can contain. Hallelujah! Cause you're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be.
Jesus. Amen. 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 We always have a reason to praise. Amen. And I'll always think of a reason to sing that song. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm afraid it's gonna, I'm going to wear it out, but if people keep requesting it, then I don't have to worry about it. That's right. That's right. Well, amen. Well, I hope you're praising the Lord with us, and I hope you're feeling that hope that He's bigger than all our problems. Amen. He's bigger than anything. Amen. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. And, and yes, the enemy is at work in the world, and He's... He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's out to accuse. He's out to rob of faith. He's out to hurt. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus is, is with us. And lo, I am with you always, he says, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. So again, if you want to send a, a, a question in, you can post it in the comment section below the YouTube live stream. Or you can send it to Kevin at 661-212-5415. We're going to go ahead and get into some of your questions. Uh, thank you for sending those in. And uh, if you want us to answer, we'll do our best to answer while we're still online. If your question comes in while we're still online. So, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to say right off the bat that we have Brother Shahar with us here. And he's going to tell us some of his story. Um, but before we get into the story, which is the exciting part, we're going to get into questions which is the exciting part. So just different kind of excitement. So Amen. Kevin, I haven't seen any of the questions that have come in, but let's, let's get into those. Okay. Uh, we can start with a pretty straightforward one. It's just um, what, what are the requirements for becoming a part of our community? I should make you answer that because you've only been part of our community about two years. <laughs> How would you answer that? Well, I would say... Um, Really, repentance is going to be the, the, the main one, Amen. you know, in no longer seeking selfish ambition, um, a willingness to enter into covenants with a people, a revelation of the body, yes. and how God wants to bring his people together so Amen. that we might be uh, all that he intended us to be, that the word might become flesh in a people, Amen. you know, and there's got to be a love, there's got to be a, a, a unity, there's yes. got to be a oneness, a wholeness. Uh, being, we talk a lot about being fitly framed into yes. one another uh, as, as a temple, uh, as a dwelling place for God and His Spirit. Amen. You know, we, um, there's a, um, a rightly relating to one another yes. and all things, Amen. you know. Um, and so I think really coming to repentance, which would bring you to a place where you're willing to live your life according to His will, uh, to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and be willing to enter into uh, each relationship that he has given you, that he has put in your life, Amen. and rightly enter into those relationships. Not just be, you know, I've, I've often said that you can be in the right place at the right time with the right people, hmm. and have all the right relationships right there, but only to the extent to which you're willing to give yourself over to those relationships, Amen. and give to those relationships, and receive from those relationships everything God would have you give and receive, um, are you going to experience what God would have you experience within the context of a body? So Amen. that would be my Amen. quick... Uh, well, I think that's a very heartfelt and accurate answer. And I think you're speaking from experience. And I, I would generally say, first, you need to really know us. You need to be around enough, generally about a year or so, but you need to be around enough to know us. Then you need to know what we believe, know what our convictions are, and, and what shapes and forms our identity, and make sure that that's really something that you agree to, that, that is not just something you're accepting from somebody else, but that is your conviction also. It's something that God has confirmed to your heart, is His Word. And then um, you need to know that God, you need to feel in your heart with conviction that God has made this choice for you, that it's His will. And uh, yeah, I would say those, th those are the three things that would follow on repentance and the, the things you named, which are so essential. Um, but yeah, know us, make sure God's revealed the same convictions to your heart that form our identity, and, and then uh, Make sure that the Lord has really prompted your coming this way because the body is global, it's big, we're not all supposed to be in one church, 
and uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't presume that everybody's supposed to belong to us and only in as far as we belong to Christ. And uh, just know that God's, God has appointed the body. God has composed the body just as he wanted it to be. Make sure he's the one who's making this choice and not you and not us. Amen. So. Amen. Um, someone just wrote in, said, the scripture comes to mind, and Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Um, next question? Sure. Okay. Um, maybe I'll comment on this next question first, just because sure, please. I, I <clears throat> um, you know, one of the biggest objections that people have had uh, with us coming to this community where we come from has been the issue of the Trinity. Right. And um, I found that interesting because that's the thing that is said, yeah. but it doesn't seem to be the thing that bothers people. Right. You know, I think the thing that really bothers people is justification by faith. Yeah. Is living a life of faith, living a life that must produce something, Amen. living a life that actually costs you something and where there is fruit um, that can um, actually be an evidence of a, an unfolding relationship with God. Amen. You know, um, and so it struck me at one point where it's like, I don't really think they care about the Trinity as much as they think they care about the Trinity. Right. I think they really care about, and this is why we get accused of works-based salvation. What, what do you, you don't, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you don't have to do that. Yeah. What you, you think, you know, yeah. are you trying to earn something from God? And it's like, no, not at all, but I love him and I want to yeah. please him. You know? Amen. And so I just wanted to frame the question this way, because when I, when I saw the question, I just, I thought of that. And the question is, um, can you please explain how the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity can lend itself to doctrines like uh, penal substitutionary atonement? Yeah. And uh, I think there was a note tagged on where it said, you know, I, I think that most Trinitarians would not say that there was a big God that killed a little God, but penal substitutionary atonement, how do you get away from that? Yeah, Amen. for sure. <clears throat> you know, in the, in Christian circles of theology, there are different approaches to the atonement. There's the two big views, which are predominantly penal substitutionary atonement, and there's Christus Victor uh, atonement. And there are, there's a lot of diversity in each of those groups. So it's a little hard to succinctly describe those two groups. And there, there are things that we agree with in both of those groups, though we would generally subscribe more to the Christus Victor view than the penal substitutionary view. But even proponents of the penal substitutionary view of atonement, even, even its proponents acknowledge that one of its flaws, one of its challenges, one of the challenges of that view is that it suggests or makes allowance for there to be disagreement within the Godhead, as they say. And they're right. I, I would agree with Roger Olson and, and some others on that, where they are allowing for the so-called father in the Godhead to be filled with anger and wrath toward us, and then the Son in the Godhead to be filled with mercy and compassion for us. And in effect, that is a disagreement. That suggests two wills, which no classical Trinitarian would espouse. No classical Trinitarian. A lot of people, who, a lot of lay people who do not understand the doctrine because it's not understandable, they imagine that there are are two wills in the Godhead. But no real th uh, theologian, Trinitarian theologian, is going to accept that. That's impossible without creating tritheism, without creating polytheism, three gods. You cannot have three wills. So penal substitutionary atonement is highly problematic because it has God the Son wanting to redeem us and free us simultaneous to God the Father filled with rage toward us and wanting to kill us. And then we have this unjust death, what the Bible calls Christ's unjust death on the cross. That's not my words, that's Paul's words. He submitted to the unjust death on the cross. On the cross. So they would have, penal substitutionary, would have the Father doing something unjust because he's angry about our injustice. Now that's insane. 
as far as I'm, I'm aware. I, that doesn't make a lick of sense to me. That he is so angry about our unjust injustice that he's going to respond by killing Christ, which is an unjust death. How does God satiate his wrath by doing something unjust? That does not make any sense. So the question then becomes, you know, to whom was the ransom paid? And, and the penal substitutionary view of atonement, those proponents will say, who was the ransom? Who was the ransom? Uh, Christ's life, he died as a ransom for many to bring many to, to repentance. Who was the ransom paid to? And, and we would say, no, it's not a who, it's a what. It was paid to the endemic principle of justice or the law of compensation of nature that is in the world. And I'm not referring to the Mosaic law, but to the embedded law of sowing and reaping that is good when we work with it, that is bad when we work against it. Um, and so we would say that, that, that it's not, that the Trinity allows for this confusion in the Godhead. The Trinity is the only mechanism, and, and it, a confusion within the Trinity is an only mechanism that allows us to see this angry, wrathful Father and this compassionate, merciful Son. And so it paints the face of the devil on God. It makes God, it, it would pervert the, the scripture to, to mean more, God so hated the world, but he killed his only begotten Son instead and satiated his bloodlust against mankind. And that is not what the Bible teaches us. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, we are told that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So the actor in the atonement was Almighty God. It was Yahweh. He was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And it wasn't a God who hated us, satiating his bloodlust by killing a God who loved us unjustly. That's absurdity. It was a God who loved us in Christ, allowing him, taking on himself, as Zechariah shows, they will look on me <laughs> whom they have pierced, as they look on, on, on an only begotten son. But it's Yahweh speaking. So, yes, he's the only begotten son because in his humanity he is the son of God. But he is also Yahweh. As he says, as, as what is it, Paul, who says, watch out for the flock of God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. It's not a son versus a father. It's, a, it's God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And so the Trinity, the confusion of the Trinity and confusion within the Trinity allows people to, to create this terrible view of atonement that makes us still fearful of and wary toward God, <laughs> the Father, and, and very favorable toward the Son who took our place. I don't deny that Jesus took our place. I don't deny that Jesus is our substitutionary atonement. Yeah. But I don't, I don't agree that he, is, that he had a will to have mercy on us and the Father had, will, had a will to kill us. I believe that it was the Father's will that, that Jesus is speaking of in his humanity when he says, not my will, that is not my human will to preserve my life, but your will be done. It was the Father's will good pleasure. It was the Father's will that, that many sons be brought to glory through his sacrifice. So yes, a, a, a confusion about the Trinity allows that, allows for the penal substitutionary view of atonement and it allows Christians to talk about it in terms that even their theologians don't think about it that way. But they act like, well of course there's, there can be two wills because there's the Father and there's the Son. Well then you have two gods and you are really worshiping three gods, you are a polytheist. You are not a Christian, you are not a, a Jew. You worship three gods. If there are three wills, then there are three gods, period. And so most knowledgeable theologians or pastors who, who understand even their view of the Trinity, which we disagree with, will deny that. And then they have a problem 
well, if there's not three wills, how can you still subscribe to penal substitution? And uh, it's a mystery. Yeah, in, in a in a literal sense, I can agree with penal substitution. I believe that he took our penalty, which is our penal substitution. He took our penalty, and he was our substitution. I agree with that, but I I don't agree with it as a as a as a category, as a doctrine that, that stands for a belief system that has an angry father and a benevolent son. I don't believe that at all. I believe that it was love that caused the father to give his only begotten son. And he gave it to the judgment of justice that was already in motion, that did not require his intentionality, his aggression, his foaming at the mouth anger. Justice was an arrow already fired from the bow when God said, in the day you eat of it, you will die. We triggered that bow and the arrow was coming toward us and Jesus stepped in front of it. The arrow was not held in the hands of, of the Father who went ahead and killed Jesus unjustly in our place. That is a confusion of what was at work and who the ransom was paid. <coughs> Amen. On well, the reason some might wonder why I framed it the way I did at the beginning there, but <clears throat> I think the reason people want to hold on or have to hold on to the doctrine of the Trinity in the way that they do a lot of times is because it's so tied into penal substitutionary atonement, which would allow them to say Jesus then, because he took the wrath of God on himself, right. it, they, they go to, it is finished, it is done, he did the work. And therefore, there is nothing else that we can do. And if we do anything, it's like us saying that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. Right. And so therefore, don't, don't you go doing anything. Right. And it, it, it creates for this cheap grace sort of Christianity that I can't earn anything. Once saved, always saved. Yeah. Eternal security. It just creates this whole mess of I don't have to have a real <coughs> substantive unfolding relationship with God that produces fruit in my life and that will continually uh, require that I take up my cross, deny right. myself every single day and follow him. Right. And so that's, that's, that's what I was yeah, thinking about when I, I get it. You and have to have the Trinity or, in order or to hold on to penal substitution. I get it. And, and that is a dissonant view of scripture to say, you know, Jesus did it all. So if I obey God or make any effort toward holiness without which no one will see the Lord, I'm diminishing his sacrifice. That is an, that is an absurd and dissonant view of scripture. So in terms, of, in terms of, of our satisfaction in the eyes of justice, in terms of absorbing the penalty that we had coming to us, Jesus did it all. And there's nothing we can do to add to or take away from that. But that does not answer the question as to how we appropriate what he did. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So if I say to you, Kevin, I have a... Um, I have a, uh, a piece of land that I own that I would like to give somebody. And I am looking to find someone who is eligible for this gift. Do you understand? Yes. And I say, here are my criterion. I want someone who, um, who is younger than, than 30, who is of... Uh, let's say Hispanic descent, who uh, has at least three children. Okay, I've just given three criteria for the gift that I'm going to give them, right? Amen. And so you go out and you say to somebody, are you of Hispanic descent? And they say, you're trying to make me earn this gift. No, I'm trying to show you what makes you eligible for the gift. It's two totally different things. They're not going to pay the $10 million that it costs me to buy this land. Do you understand? Amen. But they have to match the eligibility for the gift. And, and, and Christians are, pay, are playing a pee and shell game when they confuse our substitutionary atonement that is complete at the cross with our conformity and our eligibility to receive that. Amen. It's two totally different categories. And so it, let's make it even character-based. Let's say I have a $10 million property, but I'm going to give it to someone who, um, who uh, let's say, provides for their family responsibly, um, no longer drinks alcohol, 
uh, and spends at least an afternoon with their kids a week, okay? <laughs> and I say, Kevin, go find me someone who provides for their family, no longer drinks alcohol, and spends at least a day with their kids, and I'll give them this $10 million gift. It's insanity to pretend that meeting those qualifications is paying the $10 million. Amen. It's not. They're two totally different things. And that's where they're, they're moving the pea under the shell and saying, oh, you're taking away from the finished work of Christ. Well, Christ's work is finished, but your eligibility for that work is not finished. So Paul can say things like, I fill up in my body the afflictions that are lacking in Christ's sacrifice. Does that contradict that the, that the work on the cross is finished? No, it doesn't. And he can say that Jesus can cry out from the cross, it is finished. But Paul can say, we are united with him through death, through our death Amen. in repentance. So his death gives us right standing. It's the $10 million gift. It gives us right standing before justice. But our taking up of our cross unites us to that sacrifice that he paid, which we cannot pay. His sacrifice is different from ours in every way. In its quality, in its extent, it's different from ours. He was an unblemished sacrifice. We are the lame calf. We are the blind lamb. We are a, an, a, an imperfect sacrifice. But he still requires us to give our all, to take up our cross, or else he says, you're not worthy Amen. of me. And that's what we want to be. We want to be worthy of him. And, and to say that matching the criteria to receive the gift is paying for the cost of the gift is a ludicrous lie that cheap gracers play when they move the pea under this shell and then you pick up that shell and they slide it over the end, uh, under the other shell. It's just silly. Amen. So Christ's sacrifice is our atonement and it gives us right standing. It's the propitiation of our sins, and not of ours only, but those of the whole world. Now the question is, how do I enter that sacrifice? What constitutes saving faith? What allows me to claim that sacrifice as my own? How do I appropriate that finished work? And that appropriation process is not static. It is not finished. It is entirely up to me. I have to walk while I have the light. I have to walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood will continually cleanse me from all sin. I have to obey those who have the rule over me. I have to work out my salvation in fear and trembling. I have to fear lest I who have preached to others become disqualified. I have to fear I who stand lest I fall. I have to strive to enter by the narrow way. So the process of, a, of being eligible for the big gift is an ongoing thing Amen. that must continue. The big gift is, is paid for, Amen. but my appropriation of it is what's in question. Those Amen. are two different things. Amen. I think there are people that would cringe at, just to hear the words that, you know, there, there is a uh, requirement, an ongoing requirement to be eligible. Yes. It's like, whoa, that is not Christian language, you know, in, in a lot of places. Um, it might be helpful because this helped me a lot. Um, if you feel to maybe talk about impartation and imputation a little yes. bit. Well, let's take the word eligible and use that as a synonym for Jesus' word, fit. You are not fit for the kingdom of God. He said whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit Amen. for the kingdom of God. So when I, talk, when I use the word eligible, I'm talking about fit. And everybody uses that. Everybody thinks in those terms. They just think that all you have to do to be eligible is to have a one-time belief. And I'm saying all you have to do is have a life of ongoing belief. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and you define belief as a moment in time. I define it as a progressive walk in the light. And so, yes, this is the difference between imputation and impartation. Imputation is a credit. It's where you, you are extended credit on someone else's account, and you take possession of your... We experience imputation when we get a car loan. You get... Um, that car's ownership is imputed to Kevin, unless you paid for it with cash, 
it's imputed to you so long as you make the payments. Yeah. And you can rightly say, that's my truck. And you can well do anything you want with that truck because it really is, for all intents and purposes, your truck, presuming you continue to make the payments. But as soon as you default, as soon as you quit walking by faith, quit making those payments according to the arrangement, now it's no longer your truck. Now, in our salvation, we have to have a walk of ongoing daily payments of faith where we, we, we express our trust, our faith, through obedience to Christ. And as long as we do that, our salvation is our salvation. It belongs to us. We can say, I am saved. Amen. My life is hid with God in Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is truly gain. We can say that. But as soon as we shrink back, it says, if anyone shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And the word he uses there is, if anyone shrinks back to perdition, which is to say, to damnation. Judas is the one who's called the son of perdition. So faith is not a moment in time. It's a walk, if we walk in the light. It's, an, it's, it's walk in the steps of faithful Abraham. Amen. Amen. Faith is not a moment in time. And so whenever we are walking by faith, God is, two things are happening. One, as long as we're moving forward, then our salvation is imputed to us. It is credited to us. But as we move forward, Christ's character is also being imparted to us. So we can see that someone who's a drug addict for seven years and becomes a believer and is baptized, they are saved when they come out of the waters dripping wet. Maybe their language isn't perfect. Maybe they, maybe they don't know exactly how to treat their wife. Maybe they behave in a manner that is untoward from time to time. But we say that they are saved. And we recognize that they are still going to improve. <laughs> yeah. And the saved status that they enjoy is imputation. But as they change their language for more godly language, that's impartation. Christ's character is imparted to them. As they mm -hmm. learn to be more loving to their wife, God's love is imparted to them. As they learn to be more patient, Christ's patience is imparted to them. So sanctification or maturation is the process whereby Christ's real attributes are downloaded and imparted to us. That's the work of grace that is imparted. The work of grace that is imputed is everything that remains in the difference between us and Jesus. So nobody will ever die and make it to heaven based on their imparted righteousness. That will never be enough. The gap will always be too great. And so this credit is always going to be extended. But Christ does not extend the credit except as we continually pursue the impartation. That ongoing pursuit of, of His character, of His love, of His spirit, Amen. of His goodness, that is what qualifies us for the credit. That is our payment. That is our effort that He requires. That is our striving to enter by the narrow gate that He requires in order to give us that status of, of, of an imputed righteousness, of an imputed salvation it's not like we can just stay in our, statically in our unbelief and say, He credited to me so I don't have to change. Amen. 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 Uh, yeah, there's one question here that we can... Um, <clears throat> greetings, I have a question about forgiveness. I know it says in Luke that when someone sins against you, you are to tell them about it and that if they repent, to forgive them. What if they don't repent or think they did anything wrong or don't ask you to forgive them. How does forgiveness work in that situation? I'm struggling and would love your insight. Thank you so much for your broadcast. It is a highlight of my week and has blessed me immensely. Amen. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think that forgiveness has two purposes. One is to cancel the debt that somebody owes you so that they can be free. And the other purpose that forgiveness has is to cancel the debt that somebody owes you so that you can be free. And we know that in the context of the body, Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And 
in the context of, of, of the body, that, that has a lot of meaning because we don't feel like we can go on before something has truly been resolved and repented of. Um, and once that does happen, we're good to go. But in the context of the broader culture, sometimes we need to drop it and forgive it, not because they deserve it, but because we need to be free of it. And that would be my advice is you don't need to forgive them in the sense of letting them back into your trust. You don't need to forgive them in the sense of letting them do to you what they did before. But you may need to forgive as Jesus did from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They certainly had not come to repentance. But you are forgiving them as much to let you be free from carrying that as anything else. You know, there's a saying in the world that says, Forg unforgiveness is drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. You know, don't drink that poison. Don't let unforgiveness turn to bitterness because it will only take you captive. Sometimes we forgive in the sense of we let it go and we put it in God's hands and we ask Him to deal with it. I face that even this week. You know, people's cruelty, their dishonesty, their slander can be extremely painful at times. It's shocking. You kind of think that people are going to be normal. People are going to not be like that. And yet people never cease to surprise us with the extent of their cruelty. Oftentimes people are the most cruel when they themselves have been, have been treated wrong or when they want to treat themselves wrong, when they really hate themselves, they misdirect it and, and, and end up hating you. And there's a sense in which you have to let that go because you're otherwise giving cruelty the power over your life and you'll start orbiting and wrapping around that, that stake in the ground and you don't want that. You want to be free to love God, to love His people, to not become jaded or bitter. And so you can say with Stephen, do not hold this sin against them. And it's as much to let you free as it is to let them free. But apart from repentance, there should never be a restoration of trust. There should never be a restoration of covenant. There should never be a restoration of a certain level of, of friendship that can only come through repentance. But there can be a release. I'm not the one chasing after you. I'm putting you in God's hands. Amen. Praise God. I hope you're blessed. Brothers and sisters around the world, we love you. It was wonderful being with you at the conference and the Jubilee. If anybody didn't get to see the Jubilee, they've put it up online. Um, it was up for a while and, and, and then they took it down and cleaned it up and turned up the volumes in some places. And So you're welcome to go view that, the Jubilee concert and, and experience online. Um, again, if you want to thank Brother Shahar for his contributions today, post him a comment and we'll pass it his way. God bless you. We'll see you next time.